Viewer discretion is advised. On December 11, 1927, in Pima County, near Tucson, Arizona, a camper exploring the rural grounds of a chicken ranch drove a tent stake into the buried, rotting remains of the ranch's owner, Andy Mathis. By sheer random chance, this camper cracked open more than a decaying corpse. He had sent unfurling a mystery that would galvanize rumors of a female serial killer who some say had been murdering men for decades. Mathis had been axed to death, his body hidden in a shallow grave on his own property. His murder quickly coalesced into whispers of vanishing husbands and serial murder. The killer would turn out to be a very complex, mysterious, and in some ways a very impressive woman. Hers is a tale as wild and interesting as the vast territory she once roamed. And, as we will soon see, the interesting calamity that was her life would end in a botched execution as gruesome as the crimes that condemned her. On January 26, 1927, Andy Mathis, a wealthy, cruel, and crotchety old man with a dark past, resided comfortably on his chicken farm near Tucson, Arizona. He had a live-in housekeeper, 48-year-old Eva Dugan, and he employed a young man known as Jack, who was 17. Eva had been hired a month previous, Jack only a few days, despite both being relatively new to the ranch. The help were already clashing with the master of the house, landlord and employer, Andy Mathis. One point of contention was Eva's cooking. Mathis hated it. He thought it was nasty, and he wasn't shy about telling her so. It was mentioned even that Mathis at one point accused Eva Dugan of poisoning him. She excused this concern as simply being a bit of rotten meat that made it into the meal. More broadly, Mathis thought the work ethic of Eva in particular was lacking. So much so that he fired Eva and told her to leave his property, GTFO. The following day, January 27, 1927, Mathis disappeared. Now, murder is never okay, but govern your sympathy a smidgen for Mr. Mathis. He had served time in prison for his role in a white mob's kidnapping and torture of members of the Seminole Nation near Maud, Oklahoma in 1898. That horrific act culminated in the murder of Native Americans Lincoln McKeezy and Palmer Sampson, as well as the beating and torture of several more innocent people. McGeesey and Sampson were chained to a tree and burned alive for a crime they almost certainly did not commit. Mathis played a role in their murder and he did some time for it. This was not a sweet and innocent old man. Well, you and I know that Andy Mathis was killed with an ax and buried out of sight to rot. At the time, the community thought they had a disappearance on their hands, not necessarily a murder. Neighbors soon reported that Eva Dugan had tried to sell some of Andy Mathis's possessions before seemingly vanishing into thin air herself. Authorities found Mathis, Dugan, and young Jack had all disappeared from the ranch. Also missing were Mathis's cash box and car, a Dodge Coupe. Investigators searched for Dugan and Jack as persons of interest in the disappearance of Andy Mathis and for the theft of the property from the Mathis ranch. Jack and Eva were on the run and traveled through Amarillo, Texas. At one point, they sold Mathis's Dodge Coupe for $600. This required paperwork, which they both signed, but not with their actual names. Eva signed Eva Mathis, and young Jack signed with the dead man's name, A.J. Mathis. Some accounts indicate that it's here in Texas where they likely split up. Eva then passed through Kansas City and finally White Plains, New York. It's in White Plains that police eventually identify Eva's daughter. They would never identify her son, and Eva, of course, kept many of her life's complexities as close secrets, especially details about her children. It's here the law caught up with Eva. Law enforcement had identified Eva's father, who lived in California, they tracked a postcard from Dad to an address in White Plains. She was arrested and sent back to the state of Arizona. Murder, of course, was distinctly suspected. 
but police had not found a body and they were unable to identify or locate Jack. They didn't even have his full name. They did not have sufficient evidence to pursue charges of murder. However, they did have what was needed to prove car theft. Eva Dugan was convicted and imprisoned for the theft and illegal selling of Mathis' Dodge Coupe. Nine months later, a camper discovered the decomposing body of Andy Mathis. Eva was charged with murder and faced trial. It's right about here we see the complexity of Eva Dugan reveal itself. She was born in Salisbury, Missouri in 1878. She later married and had two children that we know about, a son and a daughter. Reports indicate that her first husband left her and the children. Dugan endeavored to make a life for herself and her children. After her failed marriage at the age of 20, she relocated to Juneau, Alaska, drawn in by the Klondike Gold Rush. In Alaska, she worked as a singer and a prostitute of some renown, using the alias Clawfinger Kitty. The Klondike Gold Rush, lasting from 1896 to 1899, was a frenzied migration of prospectors to the Klondike region of the Yukon in northwestern Canada after gold was discovered there and attracted an estimated 100,000 prospectors motivated by the economic depression and the allure of instant wealth. The journey to the Klondike could be perilous, involving several routes that were incredibly challenging. With the Chilkoot Pass and the White Pass being the most notorious for their steep climbs and harsh conditions. Upon arrival, Miners faced the harsh realities of the Arctic wilderness, including brutally cold temperatures, difficult living conditions, and the constant struggle to find gold. For 20-year-old Eva Dugan, navigating this chaotic and harsh environment with two young children would have presented a myriad of challenges. The physical journey alone, often requiring carrying supplies and the money necessary for the trek and an initial homestead, would have been significantly more challenging with children, ensuring their safety, warmth, and well-being amidst the rugged terrain and extreme weather would have been a constant concern. The cost of transportation, supplies, and living essentials in the Klondike, where prices were exorbitantly high due to demand and isolation, added financial strain. Living conditions in the Klondike were primitive and challenging. With her children, Eva had to secure shelter, warmth, and food in a place where all three could be scarce, especially during the long, dark, and freezing Yukon winters. While the gold rush attracted a diverse group of individuals, the community in the Klondike was primarily composed of men. As a single mother, Eva would have found herself in a distinct minority, facing isolation and seeking out the camaraderie of other women. Relationships forged in hardship were often crucial to survival in this place. Beyond prostitution, Eva sought employment in the boom towns that sprang up, such as Dawson City. Jobs for women could include cooking, laundry, or entertainment, such as a singer or dancing in saloons, which were one of the few ways women could earn a living in such a male-dominated environment. We know that Eva earned some income as a cabaret singer during this period. Societal norms and economic conditions in this time and place generally made women highly dependent on men. This dependence was rooted in both the social structure and the economic opportunities available to women, which were significantly limited compared to men. In the case of Eva Dugan, however, she seemed to dictate some of the final terms of her romantic relationships. In the years preceding the Mathis killing, Eva got married five times. All five of Eva's husbands, in one form or another, vanished without a trace. Now, either Miss Dugan has a very broken man picker or something nefarious was targeting the dudes in her life. Putting this another way, being married to or romantically involved with Eva Dugan resulted in the murder or disappearance of at least six men. While circumstantial, the female serial killer possibility here is compelling, though female serial killers are rare, making up between approximately 5% and 10% of known US serial killers their crimes often go undetected longer than those of their male counterparts. This is partially due to societal perceptions that view women as less likely to commit such acts. Another interesting fact, 
female serial killers are far more likely to kill due to financial motive than their male counterparts. About 70% of female serial killers acted for financial gain. In contrast, only 29% of male serial killers were motivated by money. When she relocated to the Mathis Ranch in Arizona, Eva was 48. She testified that she'd had a sexual relationship with Mathis and that they used the ranch for prostitution, and also that she was forced to give Mathis a cut of all her earnings. Eva also blamed his death on Jack, who still had not been identified or located. According to Eva, Mathis had struck Jack for refusing to complete a chore, and Jack inadvertently killed Mathis when he punched him in response. The jury concluded, however, that Eva, with or without Jack, was guilty of the axe murder of Andy Mathis. She was sentenced to death and would become the first and last woman legally executed by hanging in the state of Arizona. Eva responded to the verdict with defiance, stating, I'll die with my boots on and in full health, and that's more than most of you old coots will be able to boast on. On the eve of her execution, she received a telegram from a woman who she identified as an old friend from her Yukon days, Ada. The message from Ada read, in part, I have the greatest admiration for your bravery and grit. Eva Dugan was taken to the gallows at 5 a.m. on February 21, 1930, at the age of 52. She smoked a cigarette and bantered with some of the guards as they escorted her to the platform of her demise. She kissed two on the cheek before ascending stairs to the hangman's noose. At one point she said, I don't know where I'm going, but I'm on my way. As the noose was placed around her neck, she maintained her composure and declined to utter any last words. The trap door was released at 5.11 a.m. The hangman, however, had miscalculated Dugan's weight. Eva Dugan was decapitated due to the force of the noose tightening around her neck as she fell. Her severed head rolled to rest at the feet of witnesses, aghast at the sight of the gory mishap and blood spurting from her body as it fell to the ground. Her heart continued to beat for a short time, sustaining a squirting of blood from her neck to the ongoing horror of the stunned witnesses. The long drop method of execution, while seen as more humane than the short drop method from earlier times, can go very wrong as it did in this case. If a drop is too long based on height and weight, a head can literally pop off, which of course isn't at all a tame or clean scene. Talk about the history of these judicial hanging methods in greater detail in another episode you'll find at the end screen and linked in the description below. The botched and bloody execution of Eva Dugan shocked the public. It compelled the state of Arizona to quickly stop executions by hanging and hastened adoption of the gas chamber for judicial killings by the state. Many aspects of this case went permanently cold with Eva's death baking in unknowns and mystery for eternity. The identity and fate of young Jack, the name and location of Eva's son, the missing details of her many husbands and clients, and of course, her life in the Yukon, all remain shrouded in mystery. Even the distinct possibility of other vanished men have been lost to the fog of time and to a suspected female serial killer who took many secrets under calm composure to her grave. The Florissant Fossil Beds National Monument near Florissant, Colorado, surrounded by towering trees amongst the moss and the pine needles, a murdered woman's leg protruded from the ground, just waiting to be discovered. The day of June 4, 1933 began like any other for Paul Rhodes and Donald Good, two burly, sweaty gold prospectors who ventured into the forest in search of fortune. Their quest was abruptly halted when they discovered what appeared to be a woman's leg protruding from the earth. The area was covered in many small holes, prospecting holes. Upon closer inspection, they unearthed the broken, burned, and mangled body of a woman, setting into motion a series of events that would reveal a real murder mystery of love, deceit, and cold-blooded murder in the forest. The petrified forest of Florissant in Colorado, not to be confused with the widely known Petrified Forest National Park in Arizona, is an area characterized by its ancient fossilized trees that turned to stone over millions of years. The Florissant Fossil Beds are a national park, and the murder that we are unraveling today serves as more than a scary national park mystery, but is also a cautionary tale of murder in the wilderness. 
The transformation of fossilization occurs through a process known as permineralization, where organic materials are replaced with minerals, preserving the original structure of the trees. These petrified remains are a testament to the geological history of the region, offering a window into the ancient past when these now stone trees were alive, thriving in a vastly different environmental context. The geographical areas surrounding the petrified forest, including the vicinity of Florissant and Cripple Creek, is part of the Colorado Rockies, known for its dramatic landscapes marked by mountains, forests, and valleys. This region has a rich history of mining and prospecting, especially during the Colorado Gold Rush of the late 19th century, which drew thousands of prospectors to the area in search of fortune. The small prospecting holes that crater the landscape where the body was found are remnants of this era, dotting the landscape like the scars of the dashed hopes of prospectors past seeking gold and fortune. Prospectors would dig these holes searching for signs of gold or other valuable minerals, creating a landscape that can seem almost otherworldly. These holes vary in size and depth, often abandoned once deemed unfruitful, leaving a patchwork of pits across the terrain. This region's history is a blend of natural wonder and human ambition, where the timeless beauty of the natural world meets the transient desires of those seeking fortune. The presence of these prospecting holes speaks to the enduring human spirit of exploration and the quest for prosperity, set against the backdrop of a landscape that has witnessed the passage of eons. This true crime case from history is part real-life mystery horror story and part detective story. Sheriff Ed Vineyard of Cripple Creek, a detective of some renowned himself, was tasked with unraveling this enigma. He approached this case with a meticulousness that would become legendary. Initially, the victim's identity was obscured by the violence of her demise. Beaten and battered, her features were unrecognizable, her identity stolen by her assailant's brutality. The only clues to her past life were the remnants of her existence scattered around the shallow grave. A paisley shawl, a fragment of a Chicago newspaper dated in May 11, 1933, and gasoline that failed to consume the evidence as the killer intended. Imagine walking through the foliage into this crime scene. The ground is uneven, littered with the ancient stone remnants of trees that have witnessed millennia. It's dotted with holes of varying sizes and ages. Among these natural and man-made relics, a disturbing incongruity presents itself. A human leg, clothed in silk, protruding with an unnatural angle from the ground of layered foliage and pine needles. The body lies in a shallow makeshift grave, not so much buried as concealed, an attempt to hide evidence of a heinous act. The initial observations reveal the violence inflicted upon her. She has been beaten, her skull fractured by blows that speak of a brutal struggle. Bruises adorn her head and face. She had several broken bones, breaking presumably as she was forced into the hole. Nearby, evidence of the murder's true location surfaces. Approximately 30 feet from where the body was found, the earth tells its own story. Blood-stained ground and disturbed foliage indicate the spot where the fatal encounter likely occurred. This spot, closer to a path, might have been where the perpetrator initially attacked our victim before moving her to a more concealed location. Intriguingly, the investigators discover tracks leading away from the scene, a pair of footprints made by the woman's French heels, distinct and telling. These tracks, with near certainty belonging to the dead woman herself, lead towards the area where her body was eventually found, suggesting that she had been chased and or dragged to the spot of her death. Her shoes, found nearby, corroborate this. Adding to the complexity, the crime scene is littered with personal artifacts and potential clues. Among these, the Paisley shawl, half burned and discarded, also found a piece of Chicago newspaper dated May 11, 1933. This becomes an important clue for several reasons. First, it provides investigators with a temporal anchor, narrowing down when the crime might have occurred. Since newspapers are daily publications, Finding a specific date on a fragment at a crime scene suggests that the events surrounding the murder likely happened around or after this date. Such artifacts can be particularly significant in cases where the exact time of death is difficult to determine due to the condition of the body and the nature of the crime scene. Second, the origin of the newspaper, Chicago, introduces a geographical element to the investigation. It hints at a possible connection between the victim, or perhaps the perpetrator, and the city of Chicago. This could suggest that either the dead woman or her murderer had been in Chicago close to the time of the killing. 
the victim had manicured nails, painted red, and other observations indicated this was a woman who may have been fairly well off. The post-mortem examination revealed several significant findings that were important to understanding the circumstances of her death. The examination indicated that the woman had been subjected to a violent assault. Her injuries consistent with the struggle. The cause of death appeared to be blunt force trauma, evidenced by the fractured skull, bruising on the face and head, and other injuries. Several of her fingernails were broken, and her thumb was broken and dangled loosely. These injuries suggest that she may have attempted to defend herself from the blows of her murderer. Postmortem findings indicate that she had been dead for a week or maybe even more by the time her body was discovered. All things considered, the investigators had unearthed some rich pieces of evidence. But investigations, even those that begin with promising leads and evidence, can falter or experience significant challenges due to a variety of factors. In this case, the evidence included a newspaper fragment a paisley shawl, and the condition and location of the body. While these pieces of evidence were crucial, they also require interpretation and imply multiple possible general scenarios for the murder. For instance, a newspaper with a specific date perhaps helped narrow down the timeline with the right context, but it did not directly point to a suspect. Similarly, without modern forensic techniques, it was difficult to ascertain the significance of any physical evidence found at the scene. Evidence that might seem promising initially could sometimes actually raise more questions than answers, complicating or overwhelming some investigations. This investigation unfolded with a painful slowness. Every clue was pursued, every lead followed, yet months passed with little progress. The case seemed destined to join the silent sentinels of the forest. Sheriff Vineyard's resolve, however, did not wait. Leveraging some novel forensic science at the time, he embarked on a nationwide appeal for dental records. For 16 long months, the case remained cold. The identity of the woman and her killer were enigmas that seemed destined to remain unsolved. The breakthrough came when dental records provided by a dentist in Nebraska matched the dental characteristics of the body found in Colorado. Specifically, Dr. F. G. Rode of Columbus, Nebraska reported that the dental work he had performed matched the description of the dental evidence collected from the body. This match was corroborated by another dentist, adding further confirmation to the identification. This dual confirmation provided a strong basis for the identification of the victim. Her name was Ida Hansen. The use of dental records to positively identify the victim was a relatively novel approach at the time. The matching of dental work performed on Ida Hansen by dentists in Nebraska was a turning point in the investigation, illustrating the evolving nature of forensic science and its growing importance in criminal investigations. During the early 20th century, when this case occurred, forensic science was in its nascent stages compared to the advanced practices and technologies available today. Several developments and methodologies were being introduced, laying the groundwork for modern forensic science but the field was still limited by the technology and knowledge of the time. Here's an overview of what forensic science looked like during this period and how it compares to today. By the early 20th century, fingerprinting had become a recognized and valuable method for identifying individuals, especially in criminal investigations. This was one of the first scientific methods to be widely adopted by law enforcement agencies. Photography was used to document crime scenes and evidence. Although not as sophisticated as today's digital imaging, it provided investigators with a visual record of the crime scene and could be used in court. The ability to determine blood types like A, B, AB, or O was discovered in the early 1900s. While this could not pinpoint an individual, it could exclude suspects whose blood type did not match the blood evidence. The study of bullet trajectories and firearm identification was also emerging. Experts could match a bullet to a specific firearm based on unique markings, a process sometimes known as ballistic fingerprinting. Additionally, basic toxicological analysis could be performed to detect poisons and other substances in body tissues and fluids, aiding in investigations of poisoning cases. As demonstrated in the Petrified Forest murder case, dental records could be used for identifying victims when other physical characteristics were not discernible but much of what we take for granted in criminal investigations today didn't exist back then. The most significant absence was DNA profiling, which wouldn't be developed until the 1980s. DNA analysis has revolutionized forensic science by allowing for precise identification of individuals from very small samples of biological material. 
Today, crime scene investigators use a variety of tools for detecting and analyzing evidence, including alternative light photography, 3D scanning, and luminol for detecting trace amounts of blood. These tools were not available in the early 20th century. Overall, forensic science during the period of the Petrified Forest murder case was marked by a reliance on the emerging scientific methods of the time, with a significant emphasis on observational skills and the basic scientific knowledge available. The advancements in forensic science since then have vastly improved the accuracy, efficiency, and scope of criminal investigations. Ida S. Hansen, the victim in this historical true crime case, was a Milner from Columbus, Nebraska. A Milner was someone skilled in the design, manufacture, and or sale of hats for women. This profession suggests that Ida was a creative individual with an eye for fashion and detail. Being a Milner during this time required not only artistic skills, but also business acumen. All indications are that Ida was an independent and capable woman. Investigators learned that Ida was relatively affluent, owning valuable securities worth at least $10,000, a considerable sum at that time. Of course, with identification of the body comes much needed context. Quickly, several critical pieces of evidence fell into place that led directly to a prime suspect, Charles W. Neal. Neal had developed a romantic relationship with Hansen, leading reportedly to their engagement. However, the investigation revealed that Neil's intentions were likely driven by financial gain. It turns out that he helped convince Ida to sell her business and assets. He wanted to marry her and start afresh somewhere else, so he said. The relationship was known to some acquaintances, and Ida had reportedly shared her plans to marry Neil and start a new life with him. Reports indicate that Neil had convinced Ida to sell her thriving millinery business and elope with him under the promise of marriage. However, his intentions were far from honorable. On the day Ida Hansen disappeared, Neil was reported to have been seen with Hansen, perhaps under the ruse of launching their new life together. Some interesting background came to light as well and revealed that Neil had previously operated a whiskey still near the location of the murder. Neil's familiarity with the area and his suspicious activity immediately focused the attention of law enforcement. His actions and statements regarding Ida Hansen's whereabouts and their supposed plans together were inconsistent and evasive. Neil was arrested and tried for murder. The evidence against him was largely circumstantial, but it was compelling. It included his known relationship with Hansen, the financial motive provided by her assets, his presence with her around the time of her disappearance, and his suspicious behavior before and after the murder. Circumstantial evidence, while not as directly convicting as modern forensic evidence like DNA, can be powerful in painting a comprehensive picture of the suspect's guilt when meticulously compiled and presented. During this era, circumstantial evidence carried more weight than it might be permitted to present day. Neil was found guilty of the murder of Ida Hansen. The jury, after considering the evidence presented, concluded that Neil was responsible for Hansen's death. He was sentenced to life in prison. While prison conditions before 1950 varied widely, depending on the location and the resources available, they were significantly harsher than today's standards. Some inmates were literally chained and caged. Physical abuse was common, and disease was prevalent. Many prisons were overcrowded, leading to inadequate living conditions, including poor sanitation and ventilation. This lack of space and sanitary facilities contributed to the spread of diseases among inmates. Neil served his sentence until his death, which actually wasn't long. He died May 20, 1936 of dropsy and pneumonia. In the dim, gaslit streets of Victorian London, where shadows whispered tales of horror and despair, a young boy named Robert Allen Coombs found himself ensnared in a bloody web of fate, not entirely of his own dark making. Born in the gritty embrace of Bethnal Green, his life was a tapestry of tragedy woven with threads of neglect, pain, and the sinister allure of many dreadfuls. Robert would conspire with his younger brother Nathaniel to brutally murder their mother, Known as Natty, the younger brother dwelt in the periphery of this grim tale. As you'll see, while what precipitated Mother's murder was purportedly a beating she'd given Natty, the crime's true origin is deeper and more complicated. In the early hours of Saturday, July 6, 1895, Robert Coombs Sr., father and the head of the household, departed the family home embarking on what was a routine extended period of time away. Robert Sr. was a steward on a transatlantic steamer, and him away was normal. 
The household on this day consisted of 13-year-old Robert Jr., the budding psychopath, and older brother by one year to also present Natty. And of course, dear mom, Emily Harrison Coombs, life bringer to these two miscreants, was also at home. At about 3.45 a.m. on Sunday, July 7, 1895, 13-year-old Robert retrieved a knife he had concealed in the home a week previous. He entered his mother's room, bludgeoning her first with a truncheon, which is basically a small wooden club, then stabbed her in the chest at least twice. He then fell asleep in her room, the sick shit, before sharing the news that he had murdered their mother with his brother, Natty, at around 9 a.m. on Sunday, July 8, 1895. Natty initially didn't believe Robert, but soon saw with his own eyes the bloodied body of his mother. Thing is, at least based on some historical accounts, Emily is still alive at this point. At 9 a.m., her groans of pain were audible to the boys, but they callously covered her head and departed the home together. With her mother dead or well on her way to dead, and dear old dad out at sea, the boys had found themselves with a sick bit of what might have felt like freedom some time and space for boys to be boys. In the tragic case of Emily Harrison Coombs, the injuries inflicted by her son Robert Allen Coombs were both brutal and ultimately fatal. Let's zoom in a bit on how injuries like this can harm the body. The initial bludgeoning with a truncheon or club caused severe trauma to the head, potentially resulting in skull fractures, brain injury, and internal bleeding. Subsequent stabbing in the chest would have compounded these injuries. Stab wounds to the chest often cause damage to the heart, lungs, or major blood vessels, leading to rapid blood loss, impaired oxygen delivery, and organ failure. Emily Coombs was alive hours after being stabbed, so despite some reporting of the time, it's likely that the stab wounds did not directly puncture her heart, but rather caused other critical internal injuries. A likely scenario is that the knife damage major blood vessels in the lungs, leading to internal bleeding or what's called pneumothorax or collapsed lung. In the case of lung injury, blood or air filled the chest cavity, impeding normal lung function and leading to respiratory distress. Here's why that's bad. In a healthy lung, the chest cavity is a vacuum with lower pressure compared to the outside air helping keep the lungs expanded. The vacuum is created through muscle contractions. When we inhale, the diaphragm, the main muscle of respiration, contracts and moves downward. And the muscles between the ribs, we call these intercostal muscles, contract and expand the chest wall. This expansion increases the volume of the chest cavity, creating lower pressure inside compared to the outside air. The pressure difference causes air to flow into the lungs, which are drawn to expand into the enlarged chest cavity. When these muscles relax during exhalation, the process reverses, pushing air out of the lungs. The pressure difference between the inside of the lungs and the chest cavity is crucial for normal lung functions. A punctured lung disrupts this delicate balance, allowing air to enter the chest cavity, equalizing the pressure between the cavity and the lung. This loss of negative pressure in the chest cavity prevents the lung from expanding properly, severely impacting the ability to breathe and oxygenate blood. Such a lung injury would be extremely painful. You'd initially see an increase in respiration to compensate for the injury. Labored breathing, wheezing, and other dreadful sounds would then proceed in some cases cyanosis, where the skin turns bluish due to poor oxygenation of the blood. Overall, internal bleeding from damaged blood vessels could lead to hypovolemic shock, where the body loses a significant amount of blood, reducing oxygen supply to vital organs even further. Over time, these conditions, if not medically treated, lead to organ failure and death. The combination of blunt force trauma and penetrating injuries likely caused immediate life-threatening complications, but in Emily's case, a slower, painful progression to death as indicated by her prolonged utterances of agony. Zooming back out to the case, the brothers enveloped in secrecy continued their lives with eerie normalcy. The steps they took after the murder are chilling. The following Monday, July 9, Robert took one gold sovereign from his dead mother's purse. He approached a neighbor and exchanged the coin for smaller denominations. He and his brother then spent the money, attending a cricket match at Lord's Cricket Ground in St. John's Wood. By Tuesday, the third day following the murder, the body would be showing the early signs of decomposition. 
This includes changes to skin discoloration and the onset of rigor mortis, depending on the environmental factors such as temperature and humidity. It's at this point Robert put quick lime on his mother's body. This suggests an attempt to hasten decomposition and mitigate the smell of decay. Quick lime, calcium oxide, is known to react with moisture and can dry out soft tissues which might slow bacterial growth and consequently the decomposition process. This action indicates a rudimentary understanding of body decomposition and a calculated effort to conceal the crime for as long as possible. That said, quicklime doesn't destroy a body rapidly and is not effective at concealing signs of decomposition. But A for effort, you little psycho. Robert would secure the help of a family friend, John Fox, who had some cognitive issues and was apparently also quite gullible. Fox helped Robert by pawning family valuables at several different pawn shops. Fox would hawk a gold pocket watch at George Fish's pawn shop at 545 Commercial Road in Poplar. He then went just down the road to a neighboring pawn shop at 554 Commercial Road and pawed a silver watch. Then a third stop further away to cash a mandolin. Fox would stay at the family home, the body of Mrs. Coombs rotting upstairs. The boys continued to live out their daily lives. They went to the theater, they played cricket in the backyard, and they even paid the family's rent. However, their first attempt at adulting would end about as badly as it had begun. By July 17th, their enterprising but murderous ruse crumbled. Emily's sister-in-law, after persistent visits to their house at 35 Cave Road, discovered the ghastly scene, her sister-in-law's decomposing body. Using a spare key to open the locked bedroom door, she was met with a vision of a deceased loved one crawling in maggots. The police, summoned by alarmed neighbors, arrived at the scene, marking the end of the brothers' grim secret. Robert and John Fox, the family acquaintance, were arrested at the scene. Nathaniel, initially escaping through a window, was also apprehended. The investigation revealed a chilling blend of premeditation and improvisation. From the acquisition of the murder weapon, which the boys bought a week before the murder with this purpose in mind, to the stoic use of quicklime and the calculated pawning of items for financial gain. The trial, commencing on September 9, 1895 at the Old Bailey, delved into Robert's mental state and the motivations behind the crime. The jury, grappling with the complex interplay of a distorted mind and a heinous act, ultimately found Robert guilty. He was sentenced to incarceration at Broadmoor Hospital, the youngest inmate at the time while Nathaniel was acquitted of involvement and Mr. Fox was found faultless as well. There was what we might call mitigating factors present day, but medical evidence indicated that he was relatively sane at the time of the murder. There was premeditation, recognition of wrong, attempts to cover up the crime, and a lengthy period where it took active efforts of deception to keep up the secret. Now this next bit is some of what we know may have influenced young Robert Coombs. None are an excuse for his behavior, but many may be a contributing reason. Robert Allen Coombs was pulled from his mother's womb by forceps January 6, 1882. Being a forceps baby in the Victorian era was as grisly as it sounds and meant a higher prevalence of birth injuries due to the use of those forceps. Forceps are a tool that resemble large tongs and they're used to assist in difficult deliveries. Forceps were applied to the baby's head to help guide it out of the birth canal. In this era, without modern medical practices and monitoring, the use of forceps could easily lead to various injuries, such as skull fractures, nerve damage, and brain injury. These injuries could have long-term effects, including neurological problems, cognitive impairments, or developmental delays. The presence of visible scars on Robert Coombs' temples at the age of 13 resulting from the forceps delivery suggests that his trauma at birth was significant. Such lasting physical marks indicate that the force used during delivery was considerable, potentially leading to more serious underlying injuries, both physical and neurological. This kind of trauma, especially in an era with limited medical understanding and intervention capabilities, very well could have had a profound impact on his development and behavior. Due to the trauma of Robert's birth, his parents were cautioned about striking him in the head by their physician. If we pause for a moment, this fact is revealing. In the Victorian era, corporal punishment was a very common disciplinary method in both homes and schools. 
The specific advice from a doctor to avoid hitting Robert Coombs in the head indicates that such physical punishment was absolutely the accepted norm. This advice reveals not only the prevalent attitudes towards child discipline at the time, but also an awareness of Robert's particular vulnerability. The threshold for such advice was significantly higher in the Victorian era. The fact that such a warning was necessary underscores the harshness of typical disciplinary practices during this period. But whatever his condition or disability, it's not conceivable that Robert Coombs would have escaped the practices of corporal punishment common in the Victorian era. Such disciplinary methods were widespread and socially accepted, both in educational settings and at home. They didn't need to beat the boy in the head to beat him. Corporal punishment, historically common in child rearing and education, to be crystal clear, never helps a child. The literature is very clear. Physically hitting children is recognized for its detrimental effects. Research has consistently shown that physical discipline can lead to increased aggression and violent behavior in children. Instead of teaching self-control or responsibility, it often instills fear, resentment, and anger. Corporal punishment also undermines the development of trust and secure attachments between children and caregivers. Over time, children subjected to physical discipline may develop skewed understanding of how to resolve conflicts and express emotion, potentially carrying patterns of aggression and violence into adulthood. There is a significant consensus among psychologists and child development experts that nonviolent positive disciplinary techniques are far more effective and beneficial for a child's overall emotional and psychological well-being. We know this now, but in the Victorian era, physical beatings to discipline children were common and accepted. The term labile is an apt description of Robert Coombs' emotional state. His excitement and positive anticipation of the trial like he was super legit stout to be facing murder charges and death by hanging. That anticipation contrasts sharply with his emotional breakdowns when he went on to discussing his missing cats. This lability or rapid and unpredictable emotional change can be indicative of underlying psychiatric issues, further complicating the understanding of his mental state and behavior both leading up to and at the time of the murder. The emotional ability was present long before the murders as well, and worsened when Robert's father was out at sea, which again was often. This more than hints at Robert having adjustment issues, so much so that he was prescribed potassium bromide, a substance historically used for various medical conditions including epilepsy and nervous disorders. In this era, it was commonly administered in varying doses depending on the patient's age, condition, and tolerance. For children, especially in the Victorian era, dosages would have been less standardized and more dependent on individual physician practices. Long-term use, particularly at higher doses, could lead to side effects like drowsiness, lethargy, or even more severe neurological effects. Those could include headaches, irritability, paired thinking, and personality changes. This wasn't an uncommon drug for such use at the time, and we can't know what role it may have played on Robert's psyche, but when considered with other factors, it is interesting. Maybe you have thoughts on this, or a source or important perspective I didn't find. I'd love to hear it. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. One final factor. The boy marked at birth by the forceps that ushered him into his bleak existence bore the scars not just on his temples but deep within himself. Haunted by headaches that drummed a relentless rhythm of suffering, Robert found solace in the lurid tales of Jack the Ripper, the very embodiment of the era's macabre fascination with death. Robert Coombs, at the age of 12, made a complicated journey alone to the trial of James Connum Reed. Known as the South End Murderer, this trial took place at Essex Assizes in Calmsford. Reed was accused and subsequently found guilty of the murder of Florence Dennis. This trial, which Coombs went to great lengths to witness, reflected his early and unsettling interest in violent crime and criminal proceedings. He also loved Penny Dreadfuls. Penny Dreadfuls were cheap, serialized publications popular in Victorian Britain, particularly among the young and working class audiences. Priced at just a penny, they were accessible and affordable. These publications often featured sensationalized stories filled with adventure, crime, and the supernatural. The content was typically lurid with a focus on the exploits of criminals, detectives, and other dramatic characters. Their sensational nature and graphic storytelling made them controversial, 
often criticized for their perceived negative influence on the morals of young readers. Despite this, Penny Dreadfuls played a significant role in popular culture of the time. They also, believe it or not, are a bit of an inspiration for the satire of this channel. So if that's your vibe, please do keep watching. Here comes the twist I wasn't ready for. Robert was spared the noose, but was indefinitely committed to Broadmoor Hospital for the criminally insane. He would serve 17 years, was freed at age 30, and emigrated to Australia. He would fight in the First World War, be awarded the Medal of Honor, and spent his later years as a farmer and a music teacher. Robert died at Coffs Harbor Hospital on May 7, 1949, at the age of 67. Buried at Coffs Harbor Historical Cemetery, New South Wales, Australia. In central London, fire rampaged through a family home on Little Mary Leebone Street. As we will soon see, it wasn't fire or smoke that killed in this case, but rather it was inhuman madness that murdered one and plotted the burning alive of four others. Onlookers experienced relief as children ran from the flaming inferno, consuming the home of the Benton family. But that relief quickly turned to mortal dread as one small child remained missing and others disclosed chilling details from within the burning home. It was evening, January 13, 1890, and the Blanton household was winding down. The adults in the home included Mr. and Mrs. Blanton and Sarah Hannah Callender, Mrs. Blanton's aunt. Also at home were the five children of the family, the youngest being 12-month-old Florence Ada Banton. The Mr. and Mrs. left at some point in the evening for a date night, out to a local theater for some quality time together. 49-year-old Sarah, who was great aunt to the children, agreed to watch the little rascals while mom and dad got out for some time away. At some point in the evening, a fire broke out. One of the older children was awakened by the smell of smoke. Recognizing the danger, she alerted her older sister, and they realized they needed to summon help. All four of the older children were in the same room. Unfortunately, the door to their room wouldn't open. Some invisible force on the other side prevented exit. As smoke and flame filled the family dwelling through the calamity and the cries of terrified children, a man by the name of Morgan entered the home in the hopes of rescuing the trapped residents. When he reached the room with the four older children, he found the door shut and the door handle gone. It had been removed, which prevented the children on the other side from escaping. With quick thinking and decisive action, Morgan broke open the door that had been rendered inoperable by removal of the handle. He assisted the four children in the room to safety. As the fire was extinguished, one child remained missing, 12-month-old Florence Ada Banton. The exultation of rescued young ones gave way to the sorrowful dread of a dead one. Perhaps this was a freak accident, a house fire that spread too rapidly for the most vulnerable inhabitant. But it became clear quickly that little Florence was murdered. She had a wound on the side of her head and her throat had been cut deeply. This was murder. Further evidence of a nefarious murder plot were present as well. The handle of the children's bedroom door had been removed to prevent their escape. The point of ignition for the fire was very close to this location, emphasizing a chilling homicidal intent. Lock the children in and burn them to death. Had it not been for Morgan breaking open the door, it's almost certain that all four children would have perished succumbing to the smoke and flames that consumed their once peaceful home. Blood evidence was found as well. Human blood on the hands of Sarah Hannah Callender, great aunt to the children and aunt to the dead child's mother, Mrs. Blanton. Sarah was skilled in sewing and needlework, such as embroidery, dressmaking, and tailoring. She was what the era referred to as a needlewoman, a laborer who worked on garments and textile products. She lived in the Blanton home with the family and reports from the time indicate that Sarah's relationship with others in the household was cordial and familial. How, and more importantly, why had Sarah 
entrusted with the safety of five children, tempted to murder them. Before we try to unpack Sarah's psyche, it's important we understand just how freaky some of her behaviors were. The disabling of the door by removing its handle in the context of a fire significantly escalates the danger for several reasons. Understanding the impact requires looking at both the physical and biological effects of being trapped in a smoke-filled environment. As fire consumes oxygen in the enclosed space, the availability of breathable air decreases. Individuals trapped in a room might experience hypoxia, a condition resulting from insufficient oxygen reaching the tissues, leading to disorientation, unconsciousness, and potentially fatal outcomes. Fire uses oxygen to burn, reducing the amount of breathable air available in an environment. In an enclosed space, this can lead to oxygen levels dropping quickly, not just near the fire, but in adjacent areas as well, as the fire consumes oxygen from the surrounding environment. Another scary feature, a fire can create pressure differences within a building, pulling air towards itself from other areas to fuel the combustion process. This can cause smoke and toxic gas to be drawn into spaces that are not directly affected by the fire itself, endangering occupants far from the actual flames. As the fire alters the airflow and consumes oxygen, it can also compromise normal escape routes, filling corridors and staircases with smoke and making it difficult for occupants to safely evacuate. Visibility can be severely reduced and breathable air can become scarce, even away from the flames. Smoke along with carbon monoxide and other harmful gases produced by the fire can also spread rapidly through a building via ventilation systems and any openings or cracks. These gases are dangerous to breathe and can lead to suffocation and poisoning even if the fire itself is located elsewhere in the structure. Smoke from a fire contains a mix of harmful gases including carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and various other toxic compounds produced by the combustion of materials. Inhalation of these gases can rapidly lead to unconsciousness and death. Carbon monoxide binds to hemoglobin in the blood more effectively than oxygen, significantly reducing the blood's oxygen carrying capacity. This results in vital organs, especially the brain and heart, receiving insufficient oxygen. Symptoms can include headache, dizziness, nausea, confusion, and eventually loss of consciousness and death. Keep this in mind. It's the availability of carbon monoxide, not always accompanied by unavailability of oxygen, that's a problem. High levels of CO2 in the blood can lead to respiratory acidosis, where the blood becomes too acidic to effectively sustain life. This can disrupt the function of organs and lead to serious health issues or death if not corrected. Additionally, the inhalation of hot smoke and toxic chemicals can cause direct damage to airways and lungs. The disabled door in the calendar case represented a significant issue because it effectively trapped the children in an incredibly scary and deadly environment filling with smoke and encroaching flames. They had no means of escape or access to fresh air. The removal of the door handle shows a very malicious intent to harm, capitalizing on an already dire situation to end four more young lives. Sarah Hannah Callender had left the scene by the time authorities arrived. She returned later, her hands bloodstained, which connected her directly and immediately to the murder and attempted murders in the minds of rescuers and the police. She was arrested and charged with the murder of Florence Ada Banton and the arson of the Banton family home that nearly killed four others. Investigators and the public were confounded by the senselessness of the killing and sought answers that would never truly materialize. The investigation and court proceedings that followed the crime revealed Sarah had a history of psychological disturbances. She had previously been confined in the Hanwell Lunatic Asylum, suggesting a recognized and serious mental health issue that in this era warranted institutional care. This asylum has or does go by many names, including St. Bernard's Hospital and the Hanwell Pauper Lunatic Asylum. This is a place with some significant history. Asylums sound scary, and this one did house violent offenders, as well as just some very sick people. But considering this era, this place was known for its positive treatment of even the most violent patients. 
In 1839, just two years into Queen Victoria's reign, the use of mechanical restraints were abolished in Hanwell. This is an interesting early recognition that confinement and forced treatment can themselves cause harm. After a stint at Hanwell Asylum, Sarah was discharged as cured. However, following her discharge, she wrote a number of incoherent letters to magistrates and public figures, the content of which reflected disorganized thinking and an inability to communicate coherently. Yet with her family, her interactions and relationships are described as friendly, not raving mad. The act of removing the handle of the door, intentionally impairing the children, seems planful, willful, and premeditated as well. But is that really true? And what might that tell us about how and why these crimes happen? The ability to carry out actions that appear thoughtful or show signs of premeditation does not necessarily equate to sanity, especially in the context of psychiatric conditions. In Sarah Callender's case, her ability to execute certain actions while still being mentally disorganized and in a state reported at the time as out of it can be understood through several key aspects of psychiatric conditions, such as those involving psychosis, when underlying motivation and understanding of these actions is based on delusional beliefs or profound misinterpretations of reality, you can see organized behaviors not based on a rational decision-making process. Sarah really probably was experiencing a reality very different from our own. At her trial, medical evidence was presented indicating that Sarah Callender was insane by the standards of the time. A professional assessment concluding that her mental condition was such that she should not be held criminally responsible for her actions. The jury did find her guilty, but insane at the time of the murder and arson. This verdict acknowledges that while she committed the acts, her mental state at the time rendered her incapable of understanding her actions or controlling her behavior according to legal and moral standards. Following the verdict, an order was issued for Sarah Callender's detention in safe custody rather than a standard prison, which indicates recognition of her need for psychiatric care, not punishment. The Victorian era was brutality and inequity wrapped into ideas of transformation and social change. Sarah Callender's case is not at all a happy ending, but it might just be a paradoxical glimmer of progress in a Victorian era working hard to break free from the shackles of our darkest human impulses. The brisk morning of November 11, 1817, the quiet town of Godalming was jolted awake by a gruesome discovery. Blood and brains painted the walls of a once serene domestic abode. George Chanel, a respected shoemaker and his housekeeper Elizabeth Wilson, were found brutally murdered in Chanel's home. Chanel was found upstairs in his bed, his skull fractured and throat savagely cut. Downstairs, the scene was equally horrifying, with Wilson's lifeless body on the kitchen floor, her throat similarly slashed in a brutal manner, and her head severely injured. The house, usually a symbol of humble trade and domesticity, had become a macabre tableau of violence and mystery. As the news spread, shock and fear gripped the town, and suspicion quickly fell upon Chanel's estranged son, as well as the carman, William Charlecraft setting the stage for a series of events that would captivate the public's attention and result in some true human horrors. The motive behind the brutal murders of George Sonnell and Elizabeth Wilson in Godalming in 1817 appeared to stem from a toxic mix of familial discord and financial greed. George Sonnell Jr., the main suspect and estranged son to the shoemaker, was known for his dissolute lifestyle and had a history of causing his father considerable distress. He often expressed animosity towards his father and the housekeeper, Elizabeth Wilson, accusing her of exacerbating the family's strife. The possibility of a financial motive was also strong. George Sennell Sr. was not only a shoemaker, but also a man of considerable property. Owning both freehold and personal assets worth about £1,000, a significant sum at that time. The son's desperate financial state, coupled with his resentment towards his father and Wilson, who managed the household, likely drove him to contemplate the heinous act of murder. More specifically, accounts of the time indicate Junior liked to drink, 
He boozed around and spent money until his broke ass decided to go full murder. Entitled turd for sure and likely physically dependent on alcohol, he plotted murder, enlisting the help of his father's carman or driver. It was believed that Junior saw the killing of his father and the loyal housekeeper as a means to inherit the property and relieve his financial woes. Tragically for him, underestimating the severity of the law and the community's pursuit of justice. And as we will soon see, it was an extremely gruesome bit of justice too. So please do keep watching. George Chanel Jr., son of the deceased, and William Chalcraft, Chanel Sr.'s carman, faced trial at the Surrey Assizes in Guilford on August 12, 1818. Prosecution presented a hammer and a knife with bloodstains purportedly belonging to Chanel Sr. as evidence. The prosecution argued that Chanel Jr., though not residing with his father, was frequently present at the house. Witnesses testified about Chanel Jr.'s presence near the crime scene, as well as Chalcroft's suspicious behavior. Now, ungrateful offspring murder's parent isn't exactly new, nor vice versa. But Regency England contains some grim realities worth mentioning. What follows are some of the things that may have contributed to Jr.'s behavior. None are an excuse, but many may be a contributing reason. During the early 19th century, particularly in the Regency period, that's 1811 to 1820, debt was a significant social issue in England. And the handling of debtors was quite harsh by modern standards. Debtors' prisons were a common reality during this time. Unlike prisons for criminals, debtors' prisons were for those who could not pay their debts. Notorious examples included Marshalsea and Fleet prisons. The conditions in these prisons were often deplorable and inmates could be imprisoned for years, sometimes for relatively small amounts of debt. The system was criticized for being inhumane and ineffective, as imprisoned debtors were unable to work to repay their debts. For George Chanel Jr., the pressure of debt might have been a significant burden. The threat of debtor's prison was real and terrifying. This could have led to a sense of desperation, especially if he was already struggling financially. Moreover, inheriting his father's wealth would have been a way to escape this predicament in an era where personal honor and financial stability were closely tied. The shame and social stigma attached to debt and the prospect of a debtor's prison could have been overwhelming. Junior also appears to very well have been an alcoholic. During the Regency era, alcohol consumption was common and excessive drinking was not unusual. The widespread availability and consumption of gin, in particular, led to various social problems. It's plausible that alcoholism could have played a part in the behavior of the individuals involved, potentially impairing judgment and exacerbating violent tendencies. Alcohol consumption results in disinhibition and can be associated with violence. Chronic alcohol use can lead to changes in the brain, affecting areas responsible for judgment, decision-making, impulse control, and behavior regulation. This can result in impaired decision-making and increased impulsivity, potentially contributing to antisocial or violent behaviors. Research has shown a link between alcohol abuse and increased aggression. Alcohol can lower inhibitions and impair judgment, leading to aggressive behaviors that might not occur otherwise. One final factor. Policing was still in its infancy at this time. The Metropolitan Police was established in 1829. Before this, such as when our case occurred, law enforcement was often ineffective and inconsistent, contributing to higher crime rates and a sense of impunity in some cases. There were pockets of confidence among the nefarious and some truth to it that one could get away with murder if careful. Back to the case, both Chanel Jr. and Chalcraft were found guilty and sentenced to death. But another order from the bench in addition to death. A gruesome Jack the Ripper-esque direction for their bodies to be dissected post-execution. The undersheriff arrived at Guilford Prison on the morning of the execution. Prisoners were brought out with irons on their feet and ropes around them prepared for hanging. Chanel wore a black jockey coat, a striped waistcoat, and gray pantaloons, where Chalcraft donned a new smock frock. 
They were transported to the execution site in Godalming in a caravan, accompanied by a clergyman and other officials. The execution setup included a platform and a noose for each prisoner. The prisoners appeared attentive to the clergyman's word, but maintained their innocence, refusing to confess to the crimes. After the clergyman's final prayers, the platform was removed and both men were hanged. The executioner ensured their suffering was brief by forcefully drawing down on their heels. They were left hanging for an hour before their bodies were cut down. Following the execution, the bodies of Chanel and Chalcraft were handed over for anatomical dissection, as per the sentence. This practice was common during this period, partly as an additional post-mortem punishment and partially to further medical science, which had a limited supply of bodies for anatomical study. The bodies were taken to a wagon and transported through Godalming, even halting at the house of late Mr. Chanel. Here, the bodies were carried into the kitchen with one place where the housekeeper was found murdered. Surgeons performed the initial stages of dissection in front of a large crowd. A practice not uncommon at the time as public dissections were both educational and served as a moral lesson to the public. In a more scientific context, dissection in the early 19th century was a crucial method for medical students and professionals to understand human anatomy. However, the ethical concerns are and were many. Imagine it. These two convicted murderers hanged to death, and then, in a display to the gawking crowds, the dead were cut up and placed upon the very places where their victims perished. This case, with its dramatic execution and subsequent public dissection, highlights the harsh realities of justice and the pursuit of knowledge in early 19th century England. The event would have served as a stark reminder of the consequences of crime and the willingness of Lady Justice to engage in post-mortem butchery. Nestled alongside reporting of a brutal murder arson, we find the story of victim Sarah McFarlane and her killer Augustus Dalmas. This tale of one-way romance epitomizes the Victorian era's duality, a time where the veil separating human love from inhuman murder was very thin. In the shadowy nighttime hours of Monday, May 6, 1844, Battersea Bridge became the silent witness to a tale of bloodshed and betrayal. Sarah McFarlane, a 43-year-old widow known for her kindness and generosity, lived in the Battersea Road area. Such generous spirit, however, in an era of thieving bastards, isn't without risks, as we will soon see. Ellen Gibson, Sarah's sister, last saw her around 1 o'clock in the afternoon on the day of the murder. As was her way, reports indicate she socialized and interacted with members of the community for much of the day. Around 10.30 p.m., a toll man at the Battersea side of the bridge encountered Sarah in a harrowing state. She was drenched in her own blood, blood still spurting from a wound on her neck as she staggered towards him. As she staggered towards him, she reportedly said, the Frenchman did it. This statement implicated a man she knew well, Augustus Dalmas, a Frenchman and a townie who she had been seen with earlier in the day. The generous Sarah, you see, had befriended the Dalmas family and served as a supportive, almost motherly role to the motherless children. She was not, however, interested romantically in Augustus Dalmas. Accounts of the time indicate that a possible motive for the attack was a proposal of marriage or romance from Dalmas that Sarah rejected. She was quickly taken to Swan Public House nearby, where she sadly succumbed to her injuries. In the Victorian era, public houses or pubs, yes, those pubs, were sometimes used for medical emergencies, especially in situations where immediate medical assistance was needed and a hospital or a doctor's office was not readily accessible. Pubs were central to many communities and were more than just places for drinking. They were often the nearest public space where people could gather for various purposes, including dealing with emergencies. The presence of people and the likelihood of finding someone to help made them practical locations for dealing with urgent situations like the aftermath of an assault or an accident. Dr. Connor, a physician, examined the victim, revealing a deep lethal wound on Sarah's throat in a position suggesting an attack from behind with a sharp instrument. 
The nature of the wound ruled out any possibility of self-injury. The lethal wound on Sarah McFarland's throat, described by Dr. Connor, was indicative of a deliberate attack with a sharp instrument. This kind of deep neck wound would cause significant damage to major blood vessels, leading to profuse bleeding. Such a wound would rapidly lead to critical loss of blood, causing shock and organ failure. The blood loss from such a wound would initially lead to a reduction in blood pressure, making it difficult for the heart to pump blood effectively through the body. This decreased blood flow would result in diminished oxygen delivery to vital organs, including the brain. In response, the body attempts to compensate by increasing the heart rate and constricting blood vessels to maintain blood pressure and flow to essential organs. However, with a major injury and without very prompt medical intervention to stop the bleeding, these compensating mechanisms eventually fail, leading to unconsciousness and death. Given the location and the severity of the wound, death would likely have been caused by a combination of massive blood loss and shock. The fact that Sarah was able to speak and identify her assailant suggests that the wound, while fatal, did not immediately incapacitate her. This indicates that the vital areas of the brain responsible for speech and consciousness remained functional for a short period of time after the assault occurred. Dalmas, meanwhile, was on the loose and appeared to be grappling with the guilt and confusion of his crisis. His daughter, Charlotte, recounted a distressing encounter with her father shortly after the murder. Pale and agitated, Dolmas first confessed to poisoning Sarah, then retracted his statement, leaving Charlotte with a bleeding hand from an already bloody knife that he had held in his hand. Following this encounter, Dolmas disappeared into the night, evading initial capture. The aftermath of the crime was tragic. Carolyn, Dolmas's eldest daughter, overwhelmed by the news of her father's crime, descended into insanity. Meanwhile, law enforcement intensified their search for Dolmas. He would actually interact with several people after the murder, including one of his daughters, who, as mentioned, was cut grasping for her father's shaking hands, hands in which the sharp, bloody murder weapon was still firmly clenched. But he eventually was captured. He eventually was convicted and was sentenced to death. But human compassion won this day. Thomas was granted clemency at Her Majesty's pleasure, and it appears escaped the gallows. This was due in no small part to appeals for mercy from his daughters. Sarah McFarlane, a woman who had extended her kindness to a family in need, met a brutal end at the hands of the head of that very same household. A desperate man's romantic interest and his greed for the support that can come from such a kind woman has snuffed out a light in a time already far too full of darkness. In the damp and sooty morning of May 23, 1895, the town of Pontefract, shrouded in the typical gloom of an industrial English town, awoke to a tragedy that would etch itself in the town's somber history. In a modest house occupied by Joshua Bowen, a hard-working miner and his family, a scene of unimaginable horror unfolded. Shortly after nine o'clock in the morning, the air, heavy with the weight of impending doom, was pierced by a frantic summons for PC Beavers. Upon his arrival, he was met with a sight that would haunt even the most seasoned constable. Joshua Bowen, in a state of shock, grappled with the reality of his wife's actions. He stammered, she has put the children somewhere, as he restrained his wife. The constable's search led to a heart-wrenching discovery. A little boy, bearing the brutal marks of an attack with the blunt end of an axe, lay horribly injured, but alive. His innocent voice, trembling with fear, uttered the chilling words, Mama's done it with the chopper. The horror escalated in the scullery or washroom, where the constable found a peggy tub. There, in a haunting juxtaposition of innocence and death, lay two young children, two-year-old Joseph Patrick and nine-month-old Joshua submerged in a shallow grave of tub water. Let's zoom in a bit on why this is a particularly dreadful set of circumstances for young humans. At nine months, a child's lungs are still developing and their capacity for oxygen remains limited. While slightly better than a newborn, their ability to cope with water inhalation is still critically low. The youngest Joshua would have had a very limited ability to hold his breath. His instinctive response upon entering the water could have been to inhale deeply, quickly leading to drowning. But there's another dreadful possibility as well, worth mentioning. The bradycardic response. 
also known as the diving reflex, is an automatic physical reaction that occurs in humans and other animals when submerged in water, particularly cold water. This reflex involves several changes in the body, primarily bradycardia, a slowing of the heart rate and peripheral vasoconstriction. The blood vessels in the extremities, arms, and legs constrict, redirecting blood to vital organs like the heart and brain. When this response is triggered, the survival reflex is to hold your breath and open your eyes. This response is strongest in infants and gradually lessens as we age. For a nine-month-old child, the bradycardic response would still be quite pronounced. The reflex is an evolutionary adaptation that helps conserve oxygen, allowing for longer time underwater without breathing. We share this reflex with other mammals, actually. It's an interesting bit of evolutionary medley shining through. However, it's important to note that this reflex does not prevent drowning. It merely and only maybe just slows the process. A child, especially one as young as nine months, cannot hold their breath voluntarily, and they lack the skills and strength to do much else. Cruelly, this reflex could have allowed small Joshua to survive underwater slightly longer than his older two-year-old sibling, Joseph Patrick, despite him being younger and more vulnerable in other ways. We can't know the exact chain of events that unfolded beneath the filthy film of that tub of Victorian wash water. And we are dealing with estimation and possibilities here. But remember, Mrs. Mary Bone couldn't be physically restrained by her husband, and you'll soon hear she exhausted police kicking and screaming the whole way to jail. She was strong enough and in such state that dispatching both children, even in tandem at the same time, was more than possible. All that said, somewhat mysteriously, no signs of physical trauma were noted. They were cold, lifeless, and had been dead for some time. They were very dead, in fact, but with no signs of fight or struggle on them. If you've got thoughts on this piece, let me know in the comments below. That morning, a Wednesday, started with the cries of the children and then wife and mother Mary screaming, I've lost my children. Joshua Sr., dad and husband, darted about, finding first little Joe bashed in the head by the blunt end of an axe. He sent for neighbors, one of whom happened to be a constable. He likely heard another of his children then utter, Mama put them in the back kitchen somewhere. Then the constable found the bodies, face up in nine inches of water. The mother, Mary Bowen, lost in the throes of what appeared to be insanity, was a puzzle of anguish and disarray. She was off the rails, as it were, and really put up a hell of a fight with the cops and her husband. Detained with great difficulty, she was conveyed to the police station, her actions leaving a wake of sorrow and unanswered questions. Joshua, the father, is reported to have felt the calamity deeply, weeping constantly and bitterly at the horror that had befallen his household. The Bowen family recently relocated from Staffordshire in only three months' residence to Pontefract. A fortnight prior, a marital quarrel had led Mary to leave, seeking refuge with friends in Leicester, only to return to the heart of her family's destruction. But according to the husband, the night that preceded this grim nightmare was uneventful. The trial held at Lee's Assizes on July 29 unveiled the harrowing details to captivated and horrified audience. The grim portrait of a mother driven to the edge of sanity, culminating in the drowning of her two youngest children and the near-fatal axe attack on another. The jury, faced with the task of unraveling the threads of sanity and maternal love gone awry, reached a verdict of insanity. Mary Bowen, a woman of 33 years, was thus removed from society, her fate sealed by the decree of Her Majesty's pleasure. We don't know for sure what may have contributed to her behavior. We don't actually know her ultimate fate either, but some interesting possibilities shortly. In the bleak landscape of Victorian England, where industrial smog and societal inequities clouded the lives of many, the case of Mrs. Mary Bowen stands as a grim testament to the era's harsh realities. The potential contributing factors to her tragic actions are as complex as they are speculative. Here are a few possibilities. Living in an industrial town, the Bowen family would have been engulfed in the challenges of the era, long working hours, limited resources, and possibly even hazardous living conditions. The relentless grind of a miner's life, as faced by Joshua Bowen, could strain any family, both emotionally and financially. 
Victorian society's understanding of mental health was primitive at best. Conditions like postpartum depression or psychosis were often unrecognized or misdiagnosed. Mary's apparent mental breakdown and violent actions could have been the culmination of untreated psychological distress. The era's medical practices were rudimentary. The use of potent pharmaceuticals like laudanum and opium tincture was common, often without proper understanding of their effects or appropriate standards of care. If Mary was using such substances, they could have significantly altered her mental state. Victorian women also faced intense societal pressures with expectations to conform to strict roles and behaviors. Mary's role as a minor's wife, coupled with the responsibility of motherhood, might have been overwhelming, especially without a supportive community, as evidenced by her recent relocation. The family's recent move from Staffordshire hints at a lack of support network. Marital conflicts, as indicated by Mary leaving the family home briefly, could have exacerbated her sense of isolation and despair. There is even the possibility of contaminants. Living in an industrial town, the family could have been exposed to various pollutants, which might have affected their physical and mental health. We can make an informed guess about what happened to Mary. We know she was tried at Leeds, and so she likely would have been committed to one of the larger asylums in Yorkshire or a nearby county. Some of the prominent asylums in the area during that time included the West Riding Popper Lunatic Asylum, later known as High Roids Hospital near Leeds, and the Menston Asylum. These facilities were typical of the era, often large, imposing buildings set in expansive grounds. I don't know more about Mary, but maybe you do. Perhaps you're a local expert or took the next step in this case. Maybe you just have a theory about what led her to snap. Let us know in the comments below. In the aftermath, the town with its industrial heartbeat and coal-stained soul carried on, but the echoes of that tragic day lingered in the streets. Actually, that's not quite right. I'm glad you and I got to know Mary a little bit today. But to be clear, it was 19th century Victorian England. Mrs. Mary Bowen and the crimes of that day actually very quickly faded into the already violent tapestry of the broader Victorian era. A wisp of bloody disgusting in a sea of grim realities. In the vibrant streets of 1920s New Orleans beneath the whimsical jazz-filled air of the French Quarter, a ghastly discovery on Ursuline Street unfurled a story of passion, of betrayal, and of grotesque dismemberment and murder. On the unsuspecting afternoon of October 27, 1927, Nettie Compass, resident and cleaner in a French Quarter apartment building, made a ghastly discovery. Entering the second floor apartment at 715 Ursuline Street to tidy what should have been a love-filled family apartment, she first encountered traces of blood and a room in disarray. This was highly unusual and alarming. The sight of blood and disorder in the apartment immediately indicated to Nettie that something was very wrong here. How right she was. Reporting at the time indicates she ran from the scene screaming. Her discovery led two nearby men to investigate the ruckus, who in turn quickly involved the police and coroner, Dr. George F. Rowling. Upon their arrival, authorities found the apartment in disarray, with blood spatters clearly visible. In the rear room, investigators opened a trunk next to a sack of dirty laundry and found the dismembered body of Mrs. Leonid Moiti. Her bloodied bed was in the same room, and it seemed likely that she had been asleep when she was mercilessly hacked to death by her murderer. In another room, the children's room, it appears in fact, there against the wall was another foreboding trunk. Investigators approached and opened it. Perhaps not surprising by this point, within the trunk they found the body of Mrs. Teresa Moiti, Henry's wife. Along with her remains was a very large and bloodied weed or cane knife, which likewise had been dismembered. The scene unfurled further, bloody footprints and even bits of Teresa's fingers were found lying on the blood-soaked mattress in one of the rooms. Both women had been almost expertly amputated at the shoulders. Both had their heads removed and their legs had been torn from their joints. It's hard to imagine a more grisly scene. Cane knives can be a particularly dreadful weapon, and they actually make an appearance in another dreadfully curious video about the bloody history of the Caribbean. Watch for it at the end screen, or click the link in the description below. 
Police then found another weapon, a lead club covered in leather, or what's referred to as a billy club. This type of blunt weapon was common in this period, owned by police constables and law enforcement, but certainly some in the public as well. Other details emerged upon closer inspection. Teresa's wedding ring was missing, presumably having come off when the killer cut off her fingers. They located the ring, which had been forced into a gaping gash in her back. In the bathroom, they found a tub stained by more than tomato juice and a bloody men's bathroom discarded amongst a scene of bloody disgusting. It didn't take long for suspicion to coalesce around the suspects. Henry Moidy, his wife Teresa, and his brother Joseph Moidy and Joseph's wife, Leonid, along with their young children, all resided together in the small cramped apartment on Ursuline Street in New Orleans. With both Teresa and Leonid very dead and chopped up in a box, the only other adults in the situation were husbands, Henry and Joseph. Superintendent of Police Thomas Healy ordered the arrest of the Moidy brothers. Joseph Moidy turned himself into police several hours later. Henry Moidy, however, who, by the way, was a butcher by trade, yikes, eluded capture. It would be four long days post-murder before the law caught up with and arrested Henry. He confessed to the crimes. Henry confessed that he had killed his wife, Teresa, and sister-in-law, Leonid, in a drunken rage propelled by jealousy. His brother Joseph had indeed moved out of their French Quarter apartment by that time, due to infidelities by Leonid. The way the killer tells it, Teresa approached him that fateful night and told him she was cheating on him and leaving. Good riddance to bad rubbish. She supposedly piled on further by stating her intention to go out in the town with her fellow cheater and sister-in-law for some good flirting with other men. It's some time later that night that both women were killed in their beds. Henry then called a cab for his three kiddos who had been in the house this whole time and sent them off to Brother Joseph. In my review of reporting from this time, Henry is called a demon and definitely blamed for the crimes, but actually within a somewhat sympathetic context in some cases. Strange complexes and jealousy beyond the man are offered up as public reasoning for an inexplicable act. Statements from the husband reinforce swirling rumors that Teresa was having an affair with their landlord. Here are some of the killer's own words even. I did not think of killing my wife even though I knew of her infidelity until she said she was leaving me and my children the next morning. I hated her that night, but I loved her every moment up until that hour and I love her now. She was a beautiful woman. So there you have it. Just a husband and a father who snapped. There's more to this, I think. What follows are some of the factors that may have contributed to Henry's crimes. None are an excuse, but some may be a contributing reason. Henry snapped isn't exactly a novel defense. Malice of forethought refers to the intent to kill or cause serious harm before committing the act. It is a fundamental component of first degree murder charges, indicating that the perpetrator had a conscious intent to end a life. The temporal gap between the alleged provocation and the act itself suggests the presence of cognitive deliberation rather than impulsive action. This interval allowed for the formation of intent, planning, and the execution of the crime, which contradicts any defense of a spontaneous act induced by emotional distress or intoxication. Moving further, the human brain's executive functions include planning, decision-making, and impulse control. A genuine loss of control, snapping, implies a sudden overwhelming failure of these systems. However, the time elapsed between the triggering event and the crime suggests that Moiti had sufficient opportunity for reflection and decision-making, indicating that his executive functions were engaged rather than bypassed. While alcohol can impair judgment and lower inhibitions, its effect on behavior are not universally deterministic. The assertion that alcohol consumption alone led to a loss of control fails to account for the individual's responsibility in managing their actions. Moreover, the methodical nature of the crime indicates a level of coordination and forethought inconsistent with the disorganized behavior typically associated with extreme intoxication. Psychological research distinguishes between effective, reactive, violence driven by an immediate emotional response and predatory or instrumental violence characterized by goal-oriented planned aggression. The meticulous execution of the crime as evidenced by the disposal of the bodies and the cleanup of the crime scene aligns much more closely with predatory violence, again undermining a spontaneous outburst. Here's another factor. A blood-stained rejection slip from a woman's magazine was found at the scene, belonging to Leonid. 
She had penned a story, thought to be an autobiography of sorts, that warned as to the plight of the female gender during this period and the dangers of marriage. The context of Leonid's story, focusing on finding joy after a failed marriage and warning against the risks of seeking happiness outside societal norms, reflects the complex navigation of personal desires against the backdrop of restrictive gender roles. Her cautionary tale emphasizes the precarious nature of women's pursuit of independence and self-fulfillment in an era where marriage was often viewed as a life sentence, limiting women's autonomy. The Moiti sisters' tragic end in the context of alleged infidelities in terms like careless parenting being touted and thrown around by the tabloid-style press of the era illustrates the severe consequences women faced when perceived as defying societal expectations. That this complex family dynamic was actually more about Henry and Joseph's disdain for their wives violating social norms. This was male aggression. Overall, the deliberate nature of the crime, the use of skills related to his profession as a butcher, and the steps taken to conceal his actions all paint a level of premeditation that contradicts a defense of impulsivity. Moreover, the role of gender in oppressive societal norms cannot be overstated. Now on to the fate of Mr. Henry Moiti. The wife-murdering dirtbag or possessed demon, depending on who you'd ask, was convicted of double murder. Henry was spared the sentence of death. Instead, two consecutive life sentences. Well, sort of. Henry was a model prisoner for 16 years and was granted trustee status as a convict. In a not at all daring and only slightly clever escape, he became a fugitive during an unsupervised but approved visit to the post office. Nice. On the run for over a year, he was captured in California and sent back to the welcoming Louisiana prison system to serve out the remainder of his natural life. In a baffling and not at all expected move, State Governor Jimmy Davis pardoned Henry. He was free again. But of course not for long. Henry, some years later, shot his girlfriend and was again confined to prison, where he died of a stroke in 1957. But let's not end this case on the killer. This is about Teresa and Leonid Moiti, women woven into the fabric of New Orleans through the whispers of history and a wee bit of penny dreadful satire. Leonid's unpublished manuscript, a heart-wrenching narrative of love and loss, offers a glimpse into the sisters' inner worlds, overshadowed by infidelity and the harsh realities of their existence. Their tragic and misunderstood end casts a shadow over not just the quarter, but also touches the blood-soaked suffrage of an American nation.